All right, as long as nothing has changed, I should still be recording. Well, let's see if it turns on real quick. Um, and I don't have my green screen anymore because I'm moving, so I'm going, that's all packed away. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. You guys don't need to see my stupid face anyways. So I'll move that down there, okay. Uh-huh, and let's make sure we show up. And I'm gonna be going over some quick questions today. I think this is all three or three connected. All right, so I'm gonna assume everything's up and running. I'm gonna assume my sound is on, looks good. So let's get cracking. Uh, so I have some questions here from my YouTube channel just to kind of get things started. And the first one was, uh, where can I find the simple color swatches tool? So what I do when I'm loading up, so when I'm making like material IDs, come here window, material IDs for things I want to work on. For example, uh, what's something we can, so in this series, we were working on something like this. Wait for it. So we have this uh, object right here, and then you see it has a bunch of colors on it. And then if we go to consider for you can see that a little bit better. Hold down Shift and touch this little paint icon. I can turn all the colors off. And then I can go through here. I can Alt tap any one of these objects here, and I can fill it with a color, or I can Alt tap an object here, and I can, or I can Control Shift tap any poly group and isolate it, or I can grab a little piece of something, do Control Shift A, grab all of that. And at the end of the day, I can always go up here to color, fill object. I can fill with red or green or blue. Um, if I want very specific colors, what I can do, one thing I used to do, or one thing you can still do, I still do it, I suppose, is I can go to my tool menu here, and I have this simple color swatches loaded up. Now, where you would put this is underneath, uh, where are we at here, ZBrush 2018. Z tools, and if you put anything in here, you see there's a, a dog and Julie. Uh, if you and there's also the color swatches somewhere in here, simple color swatches right there. If you put it in here and then you hit the comma key and reload Lightbox, that'll show up. All you got to do is double click it, and it'll show up. So now we have this color swatches. We can drag it out, go into edit mode, and what I like to do is just kind of stick it right over here. If you wanted to show up the exact colors, I don't think it affects sampling. When I hit C over here, you can see again, um, I'm just tapping C and it's selecting a new color. You can also drag from here on here and just grab these colors. Uh, if we have the color menu open, let's just dock this over here. You're seeing uh, as I hover over red, it's 255.00. And this one is 255.0.255. This one is 00.255. Uh, so you know, having Skin Shader 4, or even if you wanted to do like matte cap red clay, it's not going to affect the colors that you select from this. But if you want to see it, you can always just do flat color, go out of edit mode, and then uh, load up the web, you know, grab the tool you want, go back here, and we'll switch this back to Skin Shader 4. And now uh, we can use this to sample from, so I can just hit C, and we can grab this color, and we go to color, fill object, and I, if I hover over this, you'll see my hotkey for this is alt control F. So we can grab this one here and do alt control F and then grab this one here. Oh, I want to make this one blue. Alt control F and then you can start filling up with material IDs. Um, so if you guys want that, I will, I have that on my drive. I, I got a link to this somewhere in one of my videos. I don't know how the best way to do this, but uh, here's a share link and hopefully in the video will just be embedded. Hey Marco, thanks for showing up. There's a color swatch if you uh, if you want, <laughs> um, and hopefully that'll let me post. I think I'm logged in correctly, uh, but we'll see. So that's one way to do material IDs. If I go out of edit mode, hit Control N, clear my canvas, that'll get rid of the uh, material ID over here on the side. Now there's another plugin that we can use under Z plugin here. If you go down here to uh, Z color, if you need this plugin. Uh, ZBrush Live, three of three connected. I don't know that I'm on Twitch right now, but I got people watching me. Well, I'm gonna think. I'm gonna assume everything's set up correctly. Um, so uh, if we go to ZBrush Downloads, Pixelogic Download Center, and you go down here to your Z plugins. And you go, and there's a Z color you can uh, download for Windows, and then you can download that to your, just like where we just were, uh, ZBrush 2018, Z Startup, Z Plug 64. Just copy those folders in here. You'll see there's a Z color folder, and then a uh, Z script, and then you restart ZBrush, and you'll have this Z color. So you can click the Z color here, 
This is a very cool uh, color thing here, and you've got olive green, sage green. Now these aren't necessarily mathematically separated values, um, but you can like click this one and say, oh, as you click through and say, oh, okay, olive green, set color, it'll go through and set your color here. And you can have this anywhere in your interface. You can just drag it all around. You can also file, um, you can save uh, Z colors that you uh, have in here. You can also uh, make new ones. You can open color swatches. Do you want to save your changes? No. And then when you go to open, it's going to want to open a Z color file. However, if you go into Photoshop, you can also import a ACO or an ASE file. So you can go into Photoshop, say, uh, you know, do your mathematically separated color swatch values, export those, import those into ZBrush. You can go through here. You can even rename them um, in here if you want to, I think. Append new. It's, I haven't really messed around in here too much. Um, yeah, you can just double click here and may, name it whatever you want. Oh, okay. Well, let me, thanks for giving me the heads up here. Let me switch this. I can do that. I can swap that name out real quick. Let's see, streaming. Give me a second. If it'll let me, let's do that. Cool, thanks for showing up. Uh, hopefully that changes the name for me. I don't know that it posted the last thing I wanted to, so I'm just gonna cross my fingers on that one. And uh, hopefully a bunch of people hoping to show up and watch Thomas won't be disappointed. Okay, so that was color, and you can use uh, Z color. There's um, there's other things you can do. I'm trying to remember. We have a plugin at work. Uh, I can't give you guys that, but um, you know that's that's one way to do color, or a bunch of ways to do color. Um, well, these certainly are informative. As a newbie, I find his presentations go so fast I cannot follow them. I wish YouTube had a speed control. So anybody, I mean, I assume everybody knows this, but sometimes. You know what you happens when you assume. So anything, uh, so you know, you can go to my YouTube channel here. You can go to my playlists. Uh, if you aren't aware, I've new that this new ZBrush for ideation. Uh, it's 55 videos for ZBrush 2018 that get you up and running in ZBrush. So any one of these, we can go through and click and say, I want to learn about uh, ZBrush Polypaint options. So we go through here and we're watching this. And if you go down here to this little settings, you're going to see speed. You can go through here. If you want to really slow me down, you do 0.25. I usually speed everything up to two just when I'm taking notes. So here's where you do your speed control, as well as if you, I think it's control or shift, yeah, shift and the period, and then shift and comma will slow down, and then shift and period, or it's the, basically it's shift and greater than, less than. So less than, greater than will also speed up and slow down videos. So just in case um, you guys didn't know that about YouTube, there you go. Uh, how do you switch back to model to edit again? Well, let me select the subtool and continue editing while I'm, I'm stuck. So if you ever jump out of edit mode here, which I actually did on purpose. So if I have an object here that I'm dragging out my canvas and actually it got in a weird state here. So I'm gonna go to drag rect and that'll let me drag out and then we'll go to skin shader four. Um, actually, we're in, a, we're in that um, dark gray state here. Let's do a quick restart here. Oh, you know what? I have Photoshop open. Let's see if I can do this. Let's go to window swatches. We were talking about swatches earlier. So these ones, these first ones I can um, go ahead and keep. Let's go in here to our editor here. Eh, boy, it's been a while since I've been in here. Uh, preset manager. So in here we can say, you know what? I like these first ones here. I'm going to grab all of these ones and we'll go ahead and delete them. Uh, and we're done. So if I wanted to save these as swatches, if I wanted to add a new swatch here, I think it's just a matter of right clicking. Uh, let's go to another color here. So if I want to type in values, so um, let's say 255, zero, zero, that's red. Or, you know, let's do um, 128, 128, 128. Okay, and then we'll name this gray. And now we got this swatch, so you can just keep doing that and making new swatches. Uh, once you've done that, we can go in here to our swatch menu and we can say 
save swatches and I'm just going to save it right in here and we'll name it test ACO. So now that we've done that, we can go back in ZBrush and you know, if we go back into the Z color, we can go Z color. I think this will work. File import and we want to go to that folder we were on, test ACO. So here's the test ACO. If you wanted to change any of these, like, hey, you know what, I don't need RGB red, I can just do red, whatever. And if you're happy with these, now you can go to File, Save, and we can just throw this on our desktop. We can say, test, this is going to be a Z color file. So now whenever you open up ZBrush, you can load up, you can go File, uh, Open, and you can just load up that Z color file. And again, this is just a window you can put anywhere. So. Hey, Jimmy, thanks for showing up. Uh, right now, I'm just going through some YouTube questions. I had like 150 comments, and boy, uh, so here's the deal. I haven't been streaming lately. Um, I'm in the process of a bunch of stupid things and then also moving. So once I'm done moving and settled in, that's going to be our early March. I'll be back to my regularly scheduled programming. Um, you'll also notice I don't have a green screen today because my green screen's packed up. So that's kind of where I am at personally. Uh, but hopefully I'll be back in a swing of things soon. But um, if you guys have any questions while you're watching, just let me know. Um, I'm just kind of going through some YouTube questions because I didn't really have anything planned today. Like, oh, I want, I definitely want to sculpt something today. So I'm just kind of going through some questions just to give myself something to do, if that's okay. But uh, again, like I said, you guys let me know if you have anything pressing on your minds and we can do that as well. Um, oh, so switching tools here. So if we go through here and we go into edit mode. Now, the reason I usually grab a Polymesh 3D out of here is because I don't have to go to make Polymesh 3D. If you grab any other primitive out of this menu here, so it's like, oh, I want to work on a helix, and you drag it out and say, okay, I want to start sculpting on it. Uh, it's not going to let you because it's a primitive. You go down here to initialize, you can go through here and say, you know what, I want to change this first. And then I can say, okay, I like this. Now make Polymesh 3D. You're going to see your initialize options have changed into your Z modeler options. And now you can go through here and you can do like group by normals and then isolate this top piece here, delete hidden. Then we can say, let's do a uh, poly group here and then here and then isolate these ones, delete hidden, stroke, curve functions, frame poly groups, brush, insert, curve. Go ahead and grab a bracelet. Um, brush, insert, curve, M, and then, uh, you know, grab a bracelet or whatever, and then you can just frame this helix here. Uh, if you can't tap off on that curve, all you got to do is go into stroke, uh, delete, and then you can go split mass points. It's under your subtool split menu. And now you have, you know, something that follows that helix curve. Now that was all uh, just kind of going through and showing the difference between make polymesh 3D and your initialize options that change. However, if you ever go out of edit mode, and sometimes I'll do that on purpose, like with the color swatches, I'll just go out of edit mode and leave it stamped on the um, monitor over here. First of all, it's going to leave a copy. So now you're just going to be dragging out copies on your canvas. Uh, if you're not in edit mode, just hit control N, that'll clear your canvas. And if you ever accidentally, it's like I said, hit T or you go out of edit mode, all you got to do, you should be able to just go into edit mode again. If for whatever reason you can't, just hit control N to go out of edit mode. Go over here, grab your tool. You didn't lose anything. Drag it back out. Go back in edit mode. And you should be up and running again. Yes, uh, everything's, everything's going pretty good, Bob. Thanks for showing up. Uh, I've just been... So here's the deal. <laughs> here's more of the deal. Uh, right now, I'm... What I'm trying to do is set up self-sustaining, um, what's the best way to say this? Self-sustaining uh, components <laughs> so that uh, once those are up and running and uh, they're, like I said, they're kind of self-sustaining, I'll be able to pull back into kind of doing things on the side and I'll be able to create a little bit more content. That's the plan anyways, it's, uh, it's happening. Things are happening now. So give me another month and I should be back to normal. <laughs> oh, okay. So that comes up too. Uh, you know, I do talk fast, obviously, and this is going to be recorded. It's going to be on YouTube and stuff. And you can go through and you can uh, rewind and fast forward and pause and take notes. But, um, you know, the YouTube slow down and speed up as well as, uh, as my voice. There was a lot of comments on my voice. So I apologize in advance if my voice sucks and you hate it, but it, it, it's just me. I can't change that. Maybe I should take like voice lessons. Uh, do you know of a way 
uh, one button way to save a mask. So there is kind of a convoluted way to save masks, but one thing you can do, uh, if we hit the comma key here, I like to use, you know, let's go into project and we'll load up this anime head. Turn off, protect, turn off, turn off perspective, turn off the floor. Uh, and then as long as you don't change the vert order, go into edit mode. Uh, you can go through here and you can make a mask or any number of masks. And if you go over here to your layers, again, you can't change the vert order in order for this to work. But if you save, uh, if so we make a new layer and we're recording on this layer. Uh, if you hover over this layer, you're going to see we're able to save poly paints, shapes, and masks here. So if we go through and we mask out certain areas and you want to keep this, um, you can. So now if you just tap this uh, and your layer will disappear. However, if you go back into recording, your layer will turn back on. So you can you can kind of use that to store layers, but uh, that I don't really, I use it for blend shapes a lot, uh, but I don't really use it for layers. Uh, Hannibal, hey! Um, Hannibal says, I often find my poly paint, uh, oh, no problem about missing last night. Hopefully the video gets posted soon. Yeah, he's on my, he's on my, my CGMA class. Um, find my poly paint applies colors and dots no matter the stroke settings, the faster the stroke, the faster, uh, farther the dots. Um, with Damien standard. So when you're poly painting, yeah, that can happen. And so what we're doing, like we have a standard brush, we go to RGB here, and then we choose a red color, and then we start painting. And actually we're recording on this, so like I was saying, it'll also record your color, uh, but we don't need to do that, so we can just bake that. Uh, so we're going through here, and if you have a very small brush size and you start making really fast strokes, um, it's not leaving dots because by default, this stroke, here has lazy mouse turned on with a step of one. If I turn lazy mouse off, then I'll start getting dots. So if you want, turn your lazy mouse on. I mean, you can crank that lazy radius up and you'll never get any dots. But um, if you change your lazy radius down to one, it'll be a very short line. It won't affect you too much. You can do, still do pretty good strokes and uh, you shouldn't leave any dots behind. In fact, on lazy mouse, if you start seeing dots behind, take your lazy step, because you can force it to leave dots behind if you want to by changing a lazy step. Crank that lazy step down to a lower number, and if you go really low, I mean, it'll kind of make your brush lag a little bit, but that should be a very smooth uh, stroke. Uh, is the button on the left, uh, triangle says, is the button on the left just under brush that says dots uh, change the freehand or something? Yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, so also sometimes the freehand stroke can work, but again, with the lazy mouse off, your computer will just kind of lag a little bit, uh, but you turn that lazy mouse on. Another option you can do is underneath this here, this mouse average. So if you turn lazy mouse off, you're gonna see this. If you crank that mouse average up, that will also kind of smooth out your stroke, but again, if you go fast enough, it'll be dots. So a couple different options for you, maybe. Um, Jimmy says, any insights regarding the speed of modeling in Maya versus ZBrush Z Modeler? Kind of depends on what you want to do and what you're comfortable with. Um, I personally, oops, um, sorry, color, fill object. I don't even remember my hotkeys. I haven't even been really been able to use ZBrush that much. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, so Z Modeler. So any object you have in here, you can go down here. I like to initialize, start with a Q cube, go through here, and then we can go say, okay, Q mesh, poly group all. Let's go to skin shader for us. So you can see a little bit better. And we can start Q meshing this stuff out, and we can grab these faces here. The reason why I like Z modeling and ZBrush is poly poly groups here. Uh, in Maya, if I wanted to like select all these top faces, I'd have to go to the side, um, select these faces, and then run an operation on them or inset them. Whereas in ZBrush, all I have to do, if I want to move all of these, I can go to Q Mesh, I can go to Flat Island, or honestly, I keep Q Mesh Polygroup all on, I just alt paint them. So I have a polygroup right there. I can also go through here and do a group by normals. That's on your polygroup menu. Let's go ahead and do a mirror and well. It's with the same on both sides. And now Q mesh polygroup ball. And I can just go through here and I can hold down shift and move these things as needed. Um, I can move these things out. I can go through here. I can insert a single edge loop or I can insert multiple edge loops. And I can start pulling these through. And then I can say Q mesh polygroup ball. I can just snap these forward or backwards or whatever I want to do. Uh, the other thing I like about Z modeler is the ability to kind of just snap through and get rid of pieces, or I can go, you know what, let's grab this one here. Um, and also I love the ability to very quickly go like, hey, you know what, crease level of three, smooth subdiv of four, and get nice creasing, and then we just run a crease tolerance on this thing. 
or in this case, I don't even need to do, uh, and all this stuff is underneath your geometry menu, by the way. And if I am going too fast and it's like, I'm just learning ZBrush, what the hell is your problem? I got you covered. Let's go back to my YouTube channel. And the reason I talk like this when I'm just streaming is just because this is just information I've gone over before. So again, the ZBrush for ideation is probably a good place to start. Or, you know, the Pixelogic, uh, go to the Pixelogic homepage, pixelogic.com. But I'll link you guys to this. I don't know if my messages are going through, but just in case, um, that might work for you. But uh, on the geometry creasing side, if we go over here to uncrease all, uh, we got dynamic subdivisions right here. So dynamic subdivisions in conjunction with creasing can work really well, uh, especially if you're doing stuff like, um, let's do shift D. So over here, if you want to do like, let's do a bridge, two poly or connected poly circle, 100% curvature, resolution eight, triangle size aligned to normal. You can go down here and you can just, uh, you know, make a little curvy edge on here. So in this particular instance, if we go over here and we set our crease tolerance and hit crease, this will be the result. And you can do shift D to jump out. It's just a preview like so. Um, however, if we undo that, if you're just doing box modeling type stuff, if you change it from smooth subdivisions just to Q grid, you can jump into Q grid here. You can change your coverage here. So as you're modeling and you're doing boxy stuff, you can already have built in bevels. You can even change it from a bevel to a chamfer, kind of round those edges out. It's kind of up to you. Uh, we'll go ahead and keep that on bevel. So as we're working again, it's just a preview. You can go through here and just, uh, let's see, go back to Q mesh here and just start doing this. Um, you can also go through here and you can say like slide edge, you can slide these edges around. A uh, million different really fun amazing things we want to cut through here. Q mesh, uh, poly group all or a single poly, but I like the alt paint. If you want to ever change these poly groups here, of course, like I said, you can group by normals, mirror and weld. You can also, it's like, hey, you know what? I want to copy this poly group over to this side. You can hold down Alt, start painting, and then tap Shift, and then start painting on this side. And you wanna grab these pink ones, hold down Shift, or tap Shift, and that'll just inherit those poly groups, and then start painting on this side and let go of Alt. Uh, then those will all be part of the same poly group. Then you can go in here to like inset poly group all region, and then do that. Uh, but again, it's just comfort and it's just the ability to very, you know, I hover over a face. I know where everything is, so that makes it a lot easier too. So when I go in here, um, for example, you know what, let's do this. Let's take these edges right here. We'll Q mesh polygroup all these ones off. Just hold down control. So now I've got these. Let's go ahead and isolate these into their own sub tool here. And then um, let's do this. Let's do insert single edge loop. There was something I specifically wanted to show off here. Let's go insert multiple edge loops. So we can go here and then we can just tap and get the same thing. We'll hit control W, we'll do an uncrease all. And then through here, if I wanted to say uh, bevel edge loop complete, we can bevel this whole top. Now, if we wanted like rounded corners, we can go in here to insert multiple edge loops, interactive elevation, then you just pull out and just kind of round those corners off here. And then again, if you don't like those poly groups, um, you can, when you're doing that insert, you can say, uh, multiple edge loops, same poly group, uh, but I'm just going to do a quick uh, group by normals. And the reason I like group by normals is because I can, uh, first of all, just do a quick mirror and weld. Then we can do a crease PG under your crease menu here, and then we can hit D for a dynamic preview. And let's change it from Q grid back to smooth subdivision. So here's our preview mesh here. And then if we want, um, you know, we can change our crease level here. So I like crease level of three, smooth subdiv of four. If we do a crease level of four and a smooth subdiv of four, what that's going to do is smooth subdiv of four, crease level of four. That'll give you very razor sharp edges. I like to build in a little bit of a bevel. So if you drop your crease level below your smooth subdiv level, that'll give you a nice little fall off there. Uh, and of course, if you did like a crease level of one, that's going to be a very large fall off here. If it's too large, you can still go in here hover over an edge, let's turn on our polyframe here, you hover over to edge, insert single edge loop, and you can just pull an edge in there and that'll change that fall off for you. It's just building in a control loop. So then you have these objects here, and then we can go down here to say like array mesh, turn on array mesh, turn on all that stuff, W, hit Y so we can go into transpose. We can drag out some copies here. And then you can use this to kind of stamp into a mesh if you wanted to. So let's say we want to go to 
uh, make mesh, and then we'll go to the other side here. We'll go to brush, create insert mesh new, and then we can go to a cylinder here, make poly mesh 3D, and let's go ahead and say crease dynamic, crease level of three, smooth subdiv of four, and then we've got a nice cylinder here, and then with this, we can say, let's drag these shapes out, and I'm gonna do, underneath your split menu here, you can split, oops, you can split, uh, I like to do split unmasked points, that'll shoot it down below, you can turn that to subtractive, turn on live boolean, and then, let's hit Y to go back in gizmo, you can then boolean these shapes out if you want to. And you can move them around, it's live boolean, so you can do whatever you want to with them, you can scale them, anything you want, but now you have access to the ability. And if you want it to push in while you're working underneath your brush menu here, come on, close, close. Underneath your brush menu here, we have uh, depth, and you can say, you know what, push that in a little bit as I'm dragging out. So now you just go through here and Uh, can you bake the creasing in? You, It's just a preview in ZBrush, and if you exported it, uh, it would just export as the low-res looking one. Uh, but all you would need to do, for example, on this one here, if we do Shift-D, that's going to go back to our um, blocky mode. D is our preview mode. If you want to go ahead and say, you know what, I like these subdivisions, I want to export them, go down here to Dynamic, Apply, and then that will be real geometry. You can go back through your subdivision levels, and that geometry is for real. And then you can bake that creasing in, though. Jenna says, uh, been missing you for a while. Everything okay? Yeah, everything's good. Uh, I've just been swamped. And I wish I was being swamped on like, hey, you guys are going to love this. I've been working on this crazy stuff, and it's going to be great. I'm not really swamped with that kind of stuff. I'm just swamped with the work stuff and then uh, moving. But I'll get back into it. I look for like mid-March. Hopefully I'll have internet turned on at my new place and everything will be set up and I'll be back back in the swing of things. And I'll be, again, all my self-sustaining components will be set up and I'll be able to spend a little bit more time doing on the side stuff, which I like doing. Yes, uh, Bear says, uh, Bear Wolf Fish says, uh, I love the model controlling edges can be a bit tough if you need to specify exactly where verts are going. Yeah, it can be. Um, and it's also a little bit weird too if you're used to like selecting edges and stuff. Um, for example, cylinder here, edit, make poly mesh 3D. You can go through here and I, you know, just kind of getting used to doing the whole poly group thing to do selection. So when you go through and then you like uh, inset uh, poly group ball region, then you go through and inset these things and then Q mesh poly group ball. You can hold down shift if you just want to pull along that surface normal or you can Q mesh in. Uh, but yeah, if you wanted to move these things like up a certain amount, it's a little bit more difficult to do. Um, and in fact, if I wanted to like, hey, I want to slide all these edges up a little bit, probably what I would do instead, and I want them to be all the same, what I would do instead is do something like, you know, make these their own poly group here. I would do a quick inset here just to put those edges where I want. Then I would go back through and say uh, insert single edge loop and then get rid of these. So it's kind of a different mentality to do that. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and again, I'm not the expert at Z Modeler. I kind of use it uh, as I see fit. Um, there, there's better people out there at Z Modeler than I am. But really, it's just kind of thinking box modeling and working within the parameters of the program, and you should be able to get pretty decent uh, results pretty quickly. And again, the thing I love about Z Modeler is this um, the ability to use polygroups for selections. It's like, oh, you know what? I don't want those. So I'm just going to close that up. Uh, and it's really easy too. You can just close that up. Or if I want to close up just a few of these, Alt drag and then just close these ones up. So I can go through. Or you can also, how many spans is this? 32. I can go into our transform menu and we can say activate symmetry on the Z with a radial count of 8. Oh, on the Y, sorry. And we can color these ones and then pull all these down. And now we've got a very quick little canister thing. And again, let's just play a crease, cliche level of three, smooth level of four. And uh, you can go through and you know, you'll have to resolve these edges here. And in fact, something like this, I might be inclined to do something like, you know what, let's do this. Let's do Q mesh polygroup ball. And then I'm gonna hover over these and we're gonna say Q mesh these out. And I'm going to do a, Split hidden, 
then we'll pull these things out. And on these ones, let's do a uh, crease dynamic, three smooth set to a four. And now I can use these things as live Boolean. So this one here, we can say, uh, do a dynamic, and then this one here. And now let's go through here and push these in. And again, we'll just push these like so and turn on live Boolean. And now I've got a little bit more control on a curved surface, how those things will work. Another option, more options. Cool. Um, if you would like to bevel something that is not a full edge loop, is that possible? If so, is there a good technique to make that transition smooth? Um, let me see, I think so. Now, if you have an object that is you can do partial edge loops. So like if you were to do this, uh, let's turn off X symmetry here. So, and that's just tapping X. So we're gonna say bevel edge loop complete, and then it'll go through and bevel that. And it's gonna go up through here, through that cap and back down. If you don't want that, um, you can go through here. You can say like delete flat island, and you can just kind of delete this. And then you can always close it up later again. All you gotta do is hover over an edge and you just go close convex hole, it's back. Uh, but in the meantime, we can go through here and we can say delete flat island or polygroup all in that case. Now we can go through here, we can say bevel edge loop complete and that'll go through here. I think if we do edge loop partial, no, it all goes all the way through. So when the edge loop partial, it has to go like up and then make a turn. Um, and that's another thing too, that's a little bit difficult. So if you wanted to like cut an arbitrary line through here, we can isolate this back piece here. You can go through here and do like a slice curve if you wanted to like cut arbitrary geometry through, but it's it's really not great at that, you know? Um, you can go through here and you can, if you have very specific needs, you can go through and split um, your edges through here. But then you gotta go back and do like bridge two points. Again, I'm not a Z modeler expert by any means. There's probably a lot more elegant ways people have found to do this kind of thing, but um, again, I don't do it that much. And then we go through here and we can say uh, delete edge. We can kind of delete these extraneous edges here. Um, so again, not not super ideal, uh, but ZBrush really doesn't like n-gon, so cutting arbitrary geometry through isn't, um, isn't the best. Uh, but here, if we do bevel edge loop complete, that'll give us that result. If we do bevel edge loop partial, It'll just be these ones here. You can also hover over an edge and you can do add to curve. So you can say add all these to a curve and then when you go through you can say bevel all curves and then it'll bevel all those curves. So that's another option for you if you just wanted to bevel very specific areas you can just go through and say add to curve. I just want to bevel these and then just bevel those curves. Um, let me see if I delete hidden. There we go. The reason it was giving me that blank stuff is because I undid and then there was some hidden geometry so it was hiding those bevels. But now if you go through and then you add these to your curve like so. And you can see when I was doing that I accidentally touched a polygon and it deleted the flat uh, plane. Uh, if you ever want, if you're like, hey, I'm just trying to do edge actions, hover over face, say do nothing. Hover over point, say do nothing. And now everything will only be an edge action. Uh, Hannibal says, as crazy as it sounds, when sculpting my symmetry is always off a little by default, and when sculpting a face, there's always more on one side than the other as a way to fix it. Yeah, um, I'm not sure why that would be happening though. Let's load up a face, my, my favorite face. So if you ever are off, or if you're studying with a base mesh and you notice that your base mesh, I'm just gonna kind of break symmetry a little bit here. So uh, here we have symmetry turned on. And we're sculpting, and we're sculpting. There we go. And we're sculpting, and I've I've purposely nudged this object over a little bit, so we are out of X symmetry. It still looks symmetrical. Uh, in fact, it can be completely symmetrical. No matter where you where you move your object, if I move it way over here, and I have local symmetry turned on, it's going to look at the bounding box symmetry. So if I turn on X with L sim turned on, it'll still be symmetrical. However, if I go over here, let's hold on, sorry. And then we'll, um, let's 
go ahead and smooth this out. Let's go smooth stronger here. Um, so if you nudge that over, and we have LSM turned on, it'll be symmetrical. If we turn that off, now you're going to see, oh, my symmetry is like, oh, it's, there's the middle of my face, but it's kind of over off to the left. Uh, that's world symmetry, and then this is local symmetry. Uh, so if you have that off and you want it to be world symmetrical, you can try nudging it back into place, or you can just do a quick geometry modified topology mirror and weld, and that'll ensure, as long as local symmetry is off, turn that off. If you do a mirror and weld the local symmetry on, it's going to look at your bounding box and just mirror and weld down the center of the object axis, which is not what you want because this is what we already have. Turn that off, do a mirror and weld, that'll fix it. Also, if you go down here to geometry position, you might notice your X position is off by just a little bit, like 0 0.0003. And if that's the case, it'll feel symmetrical, but it might be off just a little bit. Go into your position and just zero that out. And then that should snap it back to the middle. Cool, <laughs> thanks for showing up, side effects. Uh, let me get a, I've been talking a lot. Um, so Bash says, uh, Z modeler is not handy. I think you should get used to it. It is. It is uh, a little bit of his muscle memory, because like, yeah, when you're going in there with your Z modeler brush, and it's just, it's a little bit overwhelming at first to be like, ah, I just want to bevel. Why do I gotta do this? Or I just want to extrude. Why do I gotta? And it's like, you know what? It's just knowing where extrude is and where Q mesh is and where, all the things that you usually use, you'd be you'd be amazed how quickly you can kind of switch between them. You can, if if you want, and I wouldn't suggest doing this, um, you can go through here and say, you know what, I want my edge action to always be polygroup, and I want my face action to always be Q mesh, uh, or I want it to be Q mesh, polygroup all, and I want my point action to always be slide. So what you can do is you can take this brush, you can go brush, save as, you can throw that in your ZBrush 2018 Z Startup Z Brush Presets here. And you're gonna see I have some brush presets in here. And whenever you restart ZBrush, it's going to throw your brush that you use um, in your uh, down here. So you can rename them, you can control alt tap them, you can assign them to a hotkey. So every time you hit alt T or whatever, it'll load up your Z Modeler brush exactly how you have it set up. So you can save a bunch of different Z-Modeler brushes out if that's more useful to you. Uh, okay, Blan says you could also, you could use Add Curve in Z-Modeler. Yes! Uh, I'm totally beginner. I feel kind of lost to be honest, but uh, join this demonstration. <laughs> yes, and again, if you are a total beginner, uh, I would implore you to go to the ZBrush for ideation. Uh, this is v series one, so this is 55 videos. There's actually seven series. If you take my CGMA class, you'll get all of them. Um, but at least that'll get you started. That'll be, it's just an intro. Um, Gabor says you can mask multiple, oh, that's right. So uh, we were talking about adding, so going in here, we were, we were adding to curve. You can also go through here, you can say uh, mask edge. So you can, any edges you have masked, here you can invert that mask. And then when you go to, even if you do edge loop complete, that'll go through and just bevel these unmasked uh, areas as well. And I think that goes for, you know, anything you have masked, if you just like mask all these off um, and then you run an action on them extrude, let's do all polygons, let's see. Yeah, so I extruded all polygons, but only the unmasked polygons are working. So you don't have to use polygroups. I prefer using polygroups just because, whoops. Oh, that's another thing too. If you have slice and you want to temporarily go back to uh, visibility, just hit control and then you hit control W and there you go. Then you can keep slicing. Hey Eddie, thanks for showing up. Yeah, I, uh, I stream early. It's the only time in my day I can, I can, I can ensure that I can do it. Uh, I used UV master and some subtools don't show in substance and it's UV'd. Um, as long as everything's merged together and you use UV master and you export and, and I just for safety reasons, I really much prefer the Z plugin FBX exporter for that. Um, but even if you did have, I mean, you don't have to merge your subtools. You can have your subtools, they can all be UV'd separately. You can export your FBX and it will export your objects with UVs. But what I might do is assign different materials. Well, you could assign the same material to all the objects. I believe it would work. 
I think I don't really export directly out of ZBrush to go into Painter that much. Usually I stop by, you know, Maya or Blender to kind of set up my low res and then spit that out to uh, Painter. In fact, if you want to see more on that, you go to my YouTube channel, uh, playlists. I mean, my live streams have done it a bunch, but the Sci-Fi Pistol series, there's a speed modeling and texturing down here. Uh, if the Houdini one's really good. If you haven't used Houdini yet, uh, this is a really good place to start. This Houdini game dev tool set, you can, e I export my high reses, all my high reses out of ZBrush, throw it into Houdini, it goes through an auto, de auto game reses and UVs um, through this node graph I have set up, and this will just walk you through it. So that's, if you want to try that out, and you can try it out with Houdini Indie, it go through all the installation of that, so it's a really good supplement to ZBrush. Hey John, good morning, thanks for showing up. Uh, Hannibal says, uh, if you have a character in A-Pose but his arms are pinned to his sides uh, and his lats are sticky, is there a way to unstick lift the arm? Are you in trouble? Now, if it's Dynamesh, you're in trouble. If it's not, I mean, you're not in trouble. It's Dynamesh. You can just shove an object in there and delete it out and then just uh, kind of resculpt it a little bit. But let's say we have the Demo Soldier here. Oh, I keep open Z projects. Turn all the stuff off and then we'll do delete other. So this guy's arms are down and they are sticky. So yeah, if you have um, this thing Dynamesh together, he's just gonna have sticky armpits and you're gonna have to go through, let's do a quick mirror and weld, W, control tap, and then, you know, unsticky his arms and then just go through and, you know, like I said, put a, um, ooh, turn off dynamic. If you're, ever, if you're ever in an object and you're sculpting, it's like, whoa, lag, what's going on? Probably you accidentally hit D like I just did. That's just dynamic turned on, and that'll. Because what it's doing is previewing 158,000 polygons subdivided three times, and then you're sculpting on it. So uh, obviously that's going to hinder your performance a little bit. But anyway, you can go through here. You can fix these armpits, redynamize. You can go through, and I'm probably just Damien standard or put a boolean dynamesh in there, uh, and fix it. However, if we take our undo slider, we go all the way back down to the beginning here. If you need to uh, move these arms up, you can hit uh, R and then just drag on your object. And that'll go through and it's like, okay, I wanna move these arms. That'll just mask. Now this is actual geometry under here. So you can just mask like so. And then uh, if your lats are sticking, we can isolate these lats, make sure they are masked completely. And then now we should be able to kind of move these arms around. Um, let's hold down control and tap just to kind of smooth that out a little bit. Now it looks like his his geometry is actually kind of just modeled because you can see there's just one edge ring in between his armpit there. So we can move those out. Oh, there we go. I guess it was just grabbing too much here. So you're going to see the more leeway we give our arms here, the more we're able to go through and hold down control. And it, if you're just when you hold down control and drag, and you can do this with your, if it's easier to do with your transpose as well, you can just hit Y, go back to transpose, and then you, as you're dragging along your model, it'll follow your geometry, and then you can just rotate your arms out. Now, you probably will have to do some corrective sculpting here. The good news is with this polygroup set up, you can just isolate it, um, like so. But uh, yeah. Cool. So if I miss any questions, I apologize in advance. I'm uh, I'm probably gonna miss some as I'm scrolling through. Cool, cool. Uh, and so Houdini, you can I think it's like Houdini Indie. If you're not making more than a hundred thousand dollars on it a year, you can get it for two hundred dollars a year. That's not for a year, not terrible. Um, answering so since Painter questions today, uh, I'm on Pixel Logic's channel, so uh, we can hop into Substance Painter for a minute, um, but I I wouldn't do too much work in there today. <laughs> um, I hit the uh, learning Z model, I hit the Z class from heart, with some of the stuff was way out of date. I wish I knew more about your YouTube channel then. Memorize about seventy percent of the way. Oh, awesome! I I need some. I need to go back and watch some of my YouTube stuff. I'll there's, there's certain things that I don't do in ZBrush very often that I'll do once for a video or like, hey, what's new in ZBrush 4R8? And then I won't use it for that, that feature again for a year and then I'll try to remember how to do it and I'll fail spectacularly. But 
I try to keep it all up here. Uh, it doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, so as far as, as far as Substance Painter and baking, the Substance Painter, I just rapidly iterate through Substance Painter. Um, so the baking defaults is just what I use. Uh, if I want to do very, very precise, specific baking, I use Marmoset. So I don't know if that helps you at all, but um, Marmoset gives you a lot of control and a lot of error painting out and stuff like that. Just in case that's an option for you. Um, cool. Uh, 3D model animation, the video series. Okay, kind of. So what he was referring to, uh, if you guys missed it, Google ZBrush Summit Pavlovich, I think. There we go. So uh, there is a ZBrush Summit thing I did called uh, Using ZBrush to Facilitate Smarter Production with Certain Affinity. And if you go through this video here, uh, you'll see there's a cinematic kind of through the middle of this thing here. And so the making of this cinematic, let's let that fire up here. You know, everything was modeled. I mean, everything I did, which is the mech, the character, the weapons, everything was modeled in ZBrush and textured in Substance Painter. Uh, I didn't do that. I did the basic texturing and then Christian Gallego came in on top of me and textured everything really well. Tony Reynolds sculpted the face. I did the blend shapes and then the rest of her body I just did in ZBrush. So, and Marvelous Designer for the clothing and stuff. Uh, and then of course the FX guys, the environment guys, and they all did a great job and exported this. This is all done in Unreal, by the way. All the rendering is just Unreal Engine. And then, yeah, so this this little ZBrush Summit, I did I went through and just talked about, you know, our process of certain affinity. In fact, let's go to my art station page. This will have a better breakdown. If you go to ZBrush Summit 2018, you'll see first is up here is the tutorial series. There's 96 videos. Yeah, I'll link you guys to this. If this helps at all. Uh, basically what I did was I gave a presentation at ZBrush Summit, which is right here. Uh, it was about an hour long. And then I said, hey, I can't demo everything. So I went home and then I demoed everything I wanted to in the slides uh, in this 96 video series. So on my ZBrush YouTube channel, there should be a place playlists, uh, ZBrush Summit 2018 demos. So if you click on that, this will be the 96 videos that we went over that went over everything we talked about in the summit. So if you wanted to kind of see the making of, you know, that cinematic female, uh, I don't go real in depth on everything, but that's, that's a pretty decent overview, I think. Cool. Uh, Pencil Society, sure, shout it out. Oh, there it is. Um, why can't I sculpt just look like my reference? Is because I don't know how to draw. Um, it doesn't hurt. Uh, you don't have to know how to draw. I know I know plenty of sculptors who couldn't draw their way out of a paper bag, but are excellent um, 3D artists. Uh, so it's not necessary. But you know, in my CGMA class, the first uh, video series, well, the first video series is up on YouTube. The second one is all about um, ideation, just with. Uh, block out meshes and we go up, uh, through a little bit of that too like um, just kind of very quickly making drones or mechs or quickly sculpting out uh, accessories for humans and stuff but the second video or the second week is all about 2d uh, ideation it's using 2d tools within zbrush or just any 2d tools you have to kind of break out of the 3d mode and go into 2d mode and just start problem solving from a different angle and 2d is very good at that so kind of going back and forth between 3D and 2D is healthy, I think. And it also helps you kind of turn forms in the round. So if you ever, uh, you're trying to draw heads, for example, and you're having a problem. So let's do that for a little bit. So we go into Photoshop here. Oops, let's do this. Control new. Um, So we want to just start drawing heads. So you'll know you start out with a sphere and then we need to know which direction the head's going to face. So we're going to kind of put a midline down and then we're going to go hairline, brow line, nose line, chin line, you know, and this, this is around the three quarter view. If I cut through here, we can start putting in a jaw and then we can have the face kind of hanging out. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit more. 
and then we can put in the side of the plane of the face and then the cranium's back here and then the neck's going to come out the bottom. Um, you can see I'm a little bit rusty with my drawing here, but you kind of get the idea. And you can even just start out with a face shape or a pill shape or whatever you want. You can just start out with a shape like this and then, you know, you need your midline. And then, you know, the middle of the face is the eyeballs here and it's going to wrap around and you've got your uh, temple line over here and then your nose and then your mouth here. So as you're going through, you're in your brain or, you know, you're constructing your face so that you're turning your... Um, turning the object in 3D. So like when I'm drawing this ear, I'm thinking of it as a wedge that kind of curves in on itself. So this, it's like this. So here's the wedge shape of the ear and then it curves around like this and this will be all shaded. Uh, same thing for the head. It's basically a ball with the edges cut off and then with a midline here. And then we've got the front part of the face. Um, Cynix has a really interesting tutorial on faces where you just go through and you make a piece of paper. And then down the middle, you know, you put your midline on here, and then in the middle of the face, you add a uh, nose, and it's going to be kind of like a nose like this. I'm not doing it much justice. It's, he, his tutorials are better than mine. And then over here, you can go and put the eyes and then the mouth here. And then this is just a way to get you to think about the draft of the face and, you know, how these things work in conjunction with each other to kind of turn that face in 3D. So as you're putting your jaw, and then you can just, of course, fill out the cranium and the neck and stuff. Um, getting these things to wrap around a, a shape here. So as we're doing this, we're going through and put the glabella and the nose here and go through. And again, the mouth is wrapping around a cylinder here. So you're thinking in 3D and you're wrapping things around the surface here. Um, you can also, you know, kind of simplify this down into, here's the mouth shape. And then you put your little divot in here, these two divot down and then these ones, the mouth, the upper lip kind of overlaps the lower lip here. So you can kind of use this to kind of go through and, you know, tuck that lower lip down into that upper lip like so in a 3D type view. So it's again, it's wrapping around that cylinder here. Now, just because you're doing 3D and you're like, I know what a cylinder is, I know what a sphere is, give me a break, doesn't mean that you would necessarily be really good at drawing um, in 2D, it's really is something you would need to practice here. Uh, you know, and even like wrapping eyeballs, you know, and how far back the, you know, brow is from the upper eyelid, back from the lower eyelid, back from the uh, cheekbone, all that good stuff. But, you know, once you get, and here's your cranium and then the neck here, and this, this will be the traps and stuff. Uh, and then the hairline here, and then the, and going a little bit fast, but you get the idea. Now, once you have this sketched in, this is just a constructed face. Then, oops, let's do this. Uh, new layer, make this background layer. Let's drop this layer beneath. Let's do default X fill, and then we'll drop this down. So it's like, okay, I've got my sketch done. Then over top of this, we can zoom in. And then, uh, you know, if your lighting's coming from, you know, this direction you can do, uh, you can start going through and just start putting in, you know, what you're going to, you know, fill in those brows. And then, you know, this side of the nose is going to catch that shadow here. And then the corners of the mouth are going to catch shadow and the chin and then the eyeballs and then this side of the brow as well. And this is, you know, wrapping around the face and then the ear over here, you know, this tragus and anti-tragus and this wraps around so it's a little bit of anatomy it's a little bit of turning forms in 3d space again i'm not i'm certainly not the master of any of this stuff i'm just i'm, I'm always a perpetual student uh, but you get the idea this is you know you've got the the brow of the orbit of the socket here you know and here's the nose tucking into the cartilage of the face here and your filtrum and all that good stuff and shading. Uh, I don't have a really good pin set up right now for shading in Zebra or um, Photoshop, but that's the idea. And this would catch some shadow too. So we've got our head in here, something like this. And we, of course we want to make them, you know, looking at the lights coming in this way, there's gonna be a cast shadow here and then his pupil, that light will hit. And then this will be dark on the top and then it'll scatter um, to the other side because you know, you've got your eye here, there's the lens, and then your pupil sitting kind of at the bottom here. So when that light hits here, it's going to scatter 
to the other side. So all of this will be dark on your lens and then it'll go to light like so. So that's why the light would scatter that way. Now, yeah, those little eye bags and little uh, stuff and put little, you know, label folds and all that good stuff. So that's thinking in terms of 3D and turning forms in 2D. However, when you, if you want to practice that, um, you know, this is really good practice. You can go into ZBrush and everything, all of that stuff that we were like, okay, constructing and putting a midline and making sure we have draft to the face, it's all automatic. So when you're sculpting, it's automatic. You don't really have to think about it. Even symmetry, like, okay, I've got an ear over here. I've got an eye here. How do I make it the same on this one side? You have symmetry turned on, so it's just automatic. So the good thing is there's a lot of great stuff you can just do uh, in 3D, like symmetry and shadows, how shadows work. If we go down here to like a basic material here, and let's go ahead and turn on dynamic subdivisions here, and we'll turn on perspective. And we'll say, we'll go to our light menu here. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're, if you're learning how to do like core shadows and highlights and bounce light and all that good stuff, all of that takes a lot of practice and skill, but in 3D, it's literally just moving a light around and those core shadows update as needed. Uh, let's go ahead and put in a little fake bounce light here. Is it this one? Yeah, that'll work. So, you know, all that's kind of set up for you. Uh, however, it is good practice though, because you can, let's go ahead and we'll go back to our matte gray. Uh, if you're just learning about how to turn the forms, you can just go through and you can be like, okay, I'm gonna stay, or you can just do this. You can say, I wanna do a front view here. So we'll do shift S and then I wanna do a three quarter view here, shift S. I wanna do a profile view here. If you turn off perspective, you'll get a orthographic profile, which might be a little bit better, shift S. And then as you're moving this thing around, you can move it down, you can move it up. And then, so for example, we can just break this part down. So we'll do, um, let's do print screen. I'm gonna use green shot to just kind of grab this here. We'll say copy to clipboard. Drop that opacity down. And then just everything we just talked about, you know, you can start with your sphere here. Let's zoom out a little bit because I'm bad at drawing circles here. Start with your sphere. We'll go ahead and uh, clip off that side of the head over on this side. And then, you know, here's the midline of the face we're going to follow down. And then uh, this, this is actually go back here. This mid part of that sphere, this would be the face plane here. And then here's the middle of the face, which is your eyeballs. Above this is your brow line. And then you've got your hairline, brow line, nose line, chin line. Those are all evenly spaced. Uh, the midline right here is your eyeball line. And then this is where you go through and it's like, okay, here's the, the brow. And then your eyeballs are spheres in here. And then those lids wrap around those spheres. And then your nose goes back to your bridge. And then your mouth here is wrapping around that cylinder or that tennis ball of your mouth. So that midline is kind of misleading because it goes here all the way straight through when in reality, your midline is more of a, you know, so if you start out your midline like this, it's gonna be a little bit misleading because in reality, your midline goes here. And there's, let's say it's your hairline and brow line, nose line, chin line. It's gonna go down and then your nose is gonna come out. That's part of your midline here. And that's gonna go around your mouth curve and then around your chin curve. So that's your real true midline. Your other midline just goes straight through. It's kinda, of, it's gonna throw you off a little bit. And then, you know, here's your one eyeball. Here's your other eyeball. Midpoint down from the eyeball goes to the corners of the mouth. So here's the corner of your one mouth. Here's the corner of the other side of your mouth. So you might, when you're starting out, you're like, okay, this is, you're only gonna see very little of that other side of the mouse mouth, but when you're starting out, you may be inclined to be like, okay, now I'm gonna draw a mouth. So I'm gonna put a mouth on this guy. And then you're gonna wonder why your face looks like it's sliding off is because again, you're not thinking in terms of, you know, here's my midline. Uh, if these are, you know, let's say this corner here is equal to that corner there. So it's a very short transition here. And then there's my midline here. And now my lips look like they're actually wrapping around the cylinder. If that makes any sense. But yeah, going back and forth and you know, making your face set up and then going back into 3D and then turning things and drawing it. 
Uh, I don't. Here's the other thing too. Do as I say, not as I do. I don't actually do this, um, but you will probably find it useful. Cool. Thanks for showing up, everybody. Um, is that Unreal Video too high poly for real time games? Yeah, it is. With that, those are more cinematic models for sure. But um, you know, we can. It just it was just a proof of concept type thing. Just kind of rapidly iterate and throw things in. Um, but the there is, I do. That specifically um, is for real time. However, uh, if we go back to my the actual presentation here, um, I do cover like these things right here. This is a like a weapon sketch. So this is a simp This is a you know half you know a days worth of work, couple days worth of work. Uh, decimate it down, go into Painter, throw some materials on it, and these things do run real time. These things are actually. Uh, yeah, all these things here, I think I go through. So in Unreal, I can go through, and again, these are just sketches. These are just nothing, just kit bash or just model the stuff out and then throw them into Unreal. And these are actual real time models that are literally just concept sketches. So all of that, and you can kind of see the different versions. So yeah, this is just a 3D sketch working real time in Unreal. Uh, I also talk a little bit about animation in here where you can go through and set keyframes. There we go. So just going in here and just parenting meshes together and setting quick keyframes, you can export that as an FBX and throw that into Unreal. And then you can go, it'll just sit there and cycle through the animation. So you can go through an Unreal and go pick it up. And again, this is just a quick block out, nothing mesh, no animator, animators needed, just me parenting meshes, setting pivots, exporting, you know, 30 frames of animation and then just having it cycle through. So another way to kind of... Oh yeah, so also paint stop, I do go over in my ZBrush series, but it's like unit six, I think. Or no, I don't remember where it is, but I do go, I do cover paint stop. Um, and if you need to know where that is, that is under your Z plugin. Um, I thought it was in here. Or is it under document? No, is it under texture? <laughs> Uh, I don't remember where it is. I have a whole video. This is, this is one of those things where it's like, yeah, you have a whole video on it and you don't even know where it is because I don't use it that much. Ah, it's in here somewhere. I don't, where, why, where? Paint stop, paint stop. I know it's in there. Somewhere, somewhere in ZBrush there is paint stop. Um, also, I mean, hell, if you just wanted to, let's go into, uh, you know, it's just ZBrush. So there's, there's two ways you can draw on ZBrush. Uh, there's a quick draw. Is that in here somewhere? That's why can't I remember where these things are? I moved it off of my main uh, interface here. Oh boy, this is where I look really dumb. Um, <laughs> there's paint stop, and then there's another thing that will basically set up a little drawing. It'll frame your mesh, and it'll draw. You know what? But Honestly, it's easy enough just to grab a plain 3D here, um, make it a poly mesh. And if you want it to be a certain size, let's hit Y here, you can say, you know what, I want to work on like a landscape mesh. Now, you, in, when you're painting, you want everything to be nice and evenly divided. So let's go down here to our geometry, z mesher, and we'll do um, same, data size down to zero. And we'll just zero mesh this, get nice even cubes. I don't know why that messed up. Let's just do a quick mirror and weld. Uh, and then now we have our paper set up. So I'm gonna go in here to our subdivide. I'm gonna turn off smooth so we keep our corners nice and sharp. Those don't average. And then we just subdivide this mesh up. So now we can turn on X symmetry. Let's go into skin shader four. We can choose a black color, turn on RGB. And then, oops, turn on RGB. And then now, as we're drawing, we can draw an X symmetry. Uh, let's turn off lazy radius here. So now you can very quickly go through and uh, just start drawing. Now there are brush, pin brushes in here. So there's, this one is paint. Um, there's pin A, pin shadow. You can go through and get cool effects like that. But for my money, you know, you can just use. Um, now here's the thing too, if you just want to like quickly go through and be like, okay, this is the face I want to make here. And I'm just going to quickly sketch. Uh, you can, of course, make your brush size bigger and you can go through and you can shade pretty easily. You can hold down shift, turn, turn off Z add, and you can blur things out. And then um, go back in and you can kind of paint and you can choose different colors, of course. But um, let's say 
We're just going to do a very let's do a very broad um, uh, painting here, I suppose. And it's like, okay, now I've got my sketch in here, and maybe we'll do some. Uh, like this and now it's like okay I want to dumb this down a little bit you can go in here to RGB choose a white color color fill object uh, my color menu doesn't want to open now okay I'll do control alt F but that wants to fill everything oh there we go we can fill you can just knock that back a little bit turn it into a sketch and then we can go through here Let's turn that Z intensity back up. And you don't have to do 100% intensity. Uh, and then you can go through here and you can kind of, you know, do a little cleaned up version of whatever you're working on. Like so. And again, your big brush size, hold down shift and smooth. And, and because it's ZBrush, you can go in here and you can use your move brush. You can go through here and you can do whatever you want. It's just a 3D program as well. You're just painting on polygons. So anything you'd want to do, you can even go down subdivision levels to like, you know, drop it down in resolution, move things around here, go back up and you're back where you started. So a lot of, a lot of freedom in here. And you can also do like, um, there's my color menu. What's going on here? Um, let's activate symmetry in the Z, Y, yeah, Z count. So you can go through here, you can do radial symmetry and stuff like this. So, Uh, says, what's form in sculpting? Someone told me if you're going to want to have a good sculpt, you got to do forms. Yes. Um, so your forms are basically, if we take a detailed body, let's go in here to our CGMA, body mail. So these are the, I let, let the CGMA people have these things here just to kind of sculpt on. So if we go through here, let's do a trim curve. I'm going to grab his, oh, come on, delete lower. So we've got our object here, and then let's go ahead and say quick mirror and weld, X symmetry, and Dynamesh. So here's our high res head, and we're in here, and we're sculpting. But in order to make sure that we're building on a nice foundation, you want to worry about your forms first. Your forms are essentially, the lower the resolution we go, the more you're, only, you're going to start seeing your forms. You're getting rid of the detail, and you're going back to just the building box building blocks of how your um, mesh is set up. This really doesn't want to drop anymore. There we go. So essentially at its bare minimum, your head is an egg shape, right? In fact, let's simplify this even more. Let's go through and your head is just an egg shape. In fact, we can get rid of these here. And this is your uh, basic head shape. In fact, well, we, can get, we can keep that. Uh, so then as we add resolution, you know, you're still worried about the forms and you're still worried about, you know, you can dial in the planes of the face here. So here's that, uh, you know, your temple plane. Here's the orbit right here. And then here's the glabella and then the bridge of the nose and then the bottom of the nose here. So you're worried about the forms of the face, the planes of the face, essentially just the building blocks of how your face is constructed first. And if you get that right, as you're detailing it up, as you're raising your resolution, everything will just fall into place. So as you're going through and you're starting to get into your primary forms first, and then of course your secondary forms, and then let's go ahead and turn off lazy radius here. So here's your, um, we're going kind of into kind of secondary forms here. You can go into your standard brush, Z add, lazy mouse off. And then, you know, keep raising that resolution. And then now we can get into secondary forms here, a little bit of a filtrum, a little bit of that lip ridge that's here. And then we can 
and you know, again, looking at the draft of the face, you're not sculpting it on a flat plane. You're going through and you're making sure that everything is right. And you know, again, the planes of those faces are correct and the, the proportions are correct. Uh, all that good stuff leads up to a good sculpt as opposed to, uh, you know, just trying to sculpt on a, a cube. So if we go down here to initialize Q cube and we dynamesh this thing, it's like, okay, I want to make a face. So I'm going to go through here and I'll use a clip curve brush and I'll kind of get a, a kind of a head shape going. And let's say this is the face we want to make. And then, you know, we know the middle of the face is going to be the eyeballs here. So I'll go ahead and dial this in. We'll put in some sockets here. And then our brow is going to be above that. And then our nose is going to be here. And then our mouth is going to be here. And then, you know, here's our brow ridge. And there's our nose. And there's our mouth. And there's our labia folds. And then if you're only sculpting like this, and if you're in 3D, that's what your face is going to look like. Not real great. You know, you're all in 3D. Don't worry about all that stuff just yet. Worry about the forms of the face. You know your face is going to have draft. Um, if you put your hands, so here's my hands. I know my, I guess I can blow this up a little bit. So you have your hands like this, and you put them up to your face here, and then you take them off and you look at it. Um, that's how far back from your nose to your cheekbones your face goes. So you want to make sure you build that in. Let's go ahead and shrink this down. Yep. Again, sorry about not having a green screen today. Everything got packed. So you want to make sure that draft is built in. And even just doing something as simple as that will help immensely. Even if you do just stay in this view and you start, you know, modeling the eyeballs here and then do the brows and then the nose and then the um, mouth and then the cheekbones like so, and the brow ridge right here. Even just doing that, already your face is better. You know what I mean? Now, of course, again, before you get to all this stuff, you want to make sure your forms are correct. So that's when you go in and, you know, you try to, you can use a trim, trim dynamic and sculpt these things down a little bit. And of course the cranium for the head, you know, this very upright cranium, we can lean this back for male. We can keep it upright for a female, get rid of the brow ridge. We can do a female head. And then back here, it's like, you know, this is going to curve around, and then this is going to be your jaw here. And then your neck is going to be a cylinder. You can kind of dial this in. I'll go ahead and split. And again, when we're talking just forms, you know, the neck as a cylinder is perfectly fine. And even the head here, we can trim that off. And again, you're always working in the round in 3D, obviously. I mean, why wouldn't you? You have the ability to. It makes things so much easier um, to just be able to go through here and just check everything from every angle and make sure that, you know, you're working. Let's thin this chin out a little bit here. And that would be, you know, the starting point. John says, I've been doing some brush up on Ecorche anatomy modeling, very useful stuff all the way down the plane chains of bones and tendons. Yeah, and it is, I love Ecorche and even just drawing the stuff just because, um, this is, you know what, we're gonna be hopping back and forth. So even on this type of thing too, you know, where you start out with like, you know, here's the cylinder of the arm here. So here's, here's my arms down to my wrist. Uh, and then knowing the origin and searching and how things work and being able to turn forms as well, if we take this one down and how things wrap around, you can start, you know, wrapping the deltoid around here and then the bicep and then the tricep and then down here to the ulna and then the brachio uh, radialis through here, your ridge muscles and then your wrist and then your flexors and your extensors up here. So it just, it's, it's easier once you start getting into, and even like the rib cage here, you know, here's my uh, kind of egg shape for my rib cage. Here's the midline of that rib cage. And again, we're thinking in terms of how forms are turning and this kind of slightly tilted down. And then if you wanted to add, you know, here's your sternum here. 
and then you add your pecs to this and your pecs are going to wrap around this rounded form here and they're going to attach. So here's our clavicle and then your pecs are going to attach to your armpit here. So your ulna is going to sit kind of in here and then your deltoid is going to go about halfway down and that's going to overlap. There's going to be a little cavity in here where your deltoid goes down, goes from the clavicle around the acromion process down the uh, spine and scapula there and then halfway down the humerus. And then down here is your serratus anterior, which is actually going to wrap around and connect to the back inside of your scapula. And you've got your lats here. It also connects up in your armpit. And then your, um, so here's your rectus abdominis. And then here's your obliques. And your obliques are kind of on a male. They're going to kind of bunch up here. And then here's your belly button. And then there's that curve of the rib cage there. So doing that in 3D and then going back to 2D and then going back to 3D is a really good way to kind of Again, do as I say, not as I do. I don't do it. Um, <laughs> Kim Jong Ji, yeah, he's he's beyond. I don't even begin to understand how he does what he does. He's he's crazy. He's awesome. Uh, Loomis heads, yeah, uh, that that was kind of the Loomis head method is is very. I, I want to say like the Loomis head is that constructive ball method where you slice the ball off. Um, of course, that's not the only way. There's a million ways to draw heads, and they're all varying degrees of good. Um, there's also like um, there's constructive method. There's the uh, Riley abstractions, and they're all good to learn. And again, I'm I'm still I'm learning all this stuff, but the ability to kind of go through and um, you know just get and it kind of becomes a little bit fun once you can kind of step out of that constructive method you're just kind of constructing in your head because usually when I like construct faces they all end up looking the exact same uh, but then when you kind of free yourself up a little bit you can do some little bit wackier stuff and start um, you know going through and you know, you're still constructing, you're still making sure that, you know, eyes halfway down the eyes here, the lips are going around the face here. And then the cheekbones are back, set back and stuff like that. So, you know, as we're doing, let's put some big old eyebrows on this guy. And we'll make his hairline a little bit receding here. And, you know, brow to the nose is still your ear line here. And this ear is still going to wrap around in 3D here. So we're still going to kind of do that kind of thing. And this is all stuff you could take right directly into ZBrush. If we wanted to model this face, let's go ahead and do that. It's like, boy, I love this face. It's so good. Let's go ahead and make him for real in 3D. So we can take this face into ZBrush and we can say, okay, let's do a quick print screen. Save as onto my desktop here. We can go back into ZBrush. Texture, import. We'll go to our desktop here. Face, texture, grab it, add it. Let's go ahead and turn this down a little bit. And then now we have our head mesh here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know what, let's put a midline right down the middle of our face. So at least I know where my midline is. And then we can match this up. Now I should be using perspective. Um, now his head, he doesn't have much of a cranium in here. I can correct that. Like if I was just doing a quick sculpt and it's like, hey, you know what, I wanted to leave a little bit more room for his face there. Uh, you can certainly do that. But um, you can actually, if you wanted to, uh, go ahead and just go into RGB mode and you can just paint this face directly on. You can even paint it in symmetry here so you can make sure that your features are on there correctly. Now, of course, you're going to want to have a little bit more resolution, but honestly, for the for the for where we're at with this guy right now, uh, I think it's perfectly fine. So just really quickly, um, you know, make sure RGB has turned off your other tools if you don't want them to overwrite your, you can actually mask this and then go through here and throw this out here. Go in here with our Damien standard brush. We can start carving this in. Again, super loose. We're not getting, um, hold on, Z add. There we go. We're not getting anything major. And even if we do destroy the um, 
the drawing a little bit, that's okay because as we're going through and we're refining and we're trying to match our drawing, things are going to change. Uh, but we can always get that drawing back just by going in. So we can start adding in the lips here and then, you know, the jawline we got to put in. So we'll go ahead and just start sculpting. So as we're working in 3D, we know how things are going to work in 2D. And then when we want to go back to our 2D image, hopefully we'll be a little bit better informed. And then our hairline is going to be somewhere up here. So now I can turn this uh, so we can go ahead and raise that resolution up a little bit here. Turn that back on. Now, what I, one thing I didn't do, let's go in here to Movie Timeline Show. So what I can do is I can save this timeline so I can go back and check my work. So we just put a little dot in here. Let me go ahead and turn that off. So now it's like, okay, we're sculpting, we're sculpting, we're sculpting. And then all I got to do is hit my back arrow and then it snaps us to that. And I turn spotlight back on and then we can go through here and we can make sure that we're still matching our image. We can still paint through if we want to. We're a little bit higher resolution now. Um, so we can kind of paint our face through here. And then we can go through and make sure that you know, everything's looking good. Now, obviously I started with a very, very uh, rudimentary sketch. So that's the result I'm getting. But if we turn this off, you can see, you know, with that rudimentary sketch, we kind of got a face going. And then now it's just a matter of going in, you know, dialing in your you know primary and secondary forms here and going through and making sure that you know everything's looking the way you want it and if you want to put some eye bags in here you can also you know throw um, throw some eyeball geometry in there as an insert mesh brush uh, I'm gonna skip doing that for a little bit here we can get rid of that midline we already know where that is go through here and start building up that brow ridge and those lines here and then our Damien standard brush again. You can hold down Alt with this one here. Go through and just kind of punch these shapes in. And again, just very, very rudimentary forms. And then only, you know, make sure your ear is where you want it here. And it's this ear shape you could also do as a separate mesh completely. It's kind of up to you. But, you know, this ear is going to kind of tuck into here and then it's going to kind of come back out again and then come in and then this little piece here. Sorry, I don't remember all the terms. I just remember tragus and anti-tragus. <laughs> and then uh, helix, anti-helix, right? Something like that. So that'll be our basic uh, ear shape here. And then we can, these masseter uh, little jaw muscles here, we can bump those up a little bit here. And then again, just go through here and just keep cranking up that resolution as you get more and more refined. You're always checking the draft of your face, making sure that your objects are curving around, making sure, you know, if you want a heavier brow ridge, you can pump that out. Um, if you want these eyes to go back, if you want them to have more of an, an overbite or an underbite, you can go ahead and change this. Let's do an underbite. I like that look. And the other cool thing is in 3D, you know, you can save copies of this out. You can save layers. You can go through here and you can like, um, you can pinch features. If you want to say, hey, what would he look like with a little nose? Or you can inflate features. Uh, you can move features, obviously. So we can go through here and we can say, look okay, with a nose like this. Uh, let's give him a little bit of a smile. You can, and again, going through and you can Pinch his face, pinch his face, move stuff around. And again, just keep refining. So the lips go back in here. And go ahead and put some little, little bit of meat there underneath his lip. And we'll go in and refine his lips a little bit more. Carve in. We got a little face going. Cool. Uh, sculpting from a concept. Yeah. And basically just be like what I did is just bring in your concept through here and just match it up in spotlight and just keep going back and forth. Um, Bob says I'm having a hard time entering into a local company for game design. So for the design side, I'm, I'm fortunately I don't have too much for you. 
Um, but on the art side, I do have, and again, this is just my, basically my opinions. So if you go to my blog section here, I go through like, do you, I'll go ahead and message you guys this. Uh, do you need a college degree? Uh, and again, I don't really have an answer. It's just my experience and it's 10 years old now. So it probably isn't applicable to anybody. Uh, 2D versus 3D. Um, how to break into the games industry. Again, just my opinion. It may or may not be all that useful to you. Uh, I think there was another blog in there somewhere, but um, you can check those out and for what it's worth. Uh, gamer film industry. Is it necessary for a modeler to know how to design or a modeler just get the concept sketch from art department so to model it? And they, they kind of go through that a little bit in the 2D versus 3D. Depending on how your company's set up, you're going to get a concept, but the 3D modeler is always going to have to interpret. Uh, the better you are at interpreting and interpreting successfully, uh, and interpreting successfully is all based on design skills and design fundamentals. So the more you know, the better faster and better you'll be able to interpret and ideally you're taking a concept and you're elevating it. Um, if you're not able to do that, if you're only able to match a concept, um, that's still valuable and you know there's a lot of modelers who can't even match a concept, you know, so at the very baseline matching a concept but also being able to elevate it, make it into a better design because a concept on a 2D image is only so useful. Uh, it may look great in 2D, you make it in 3D, you get it in game and realize, oh, actually from the back three corner, with the only way you're gonna see this character, everything's bad about it. The front looks great, who cares because you never see the front in this game. So, you know, really dumb ways to design, but that's we do really dumb things in our industry. Um, same thing with weapon design. It may look great from the side view, and you can model it from the side view, and you know, go in ZBrush and model it. You put it in game, your uh, field of view is off, or it's different than you would have thought. You get it in and realize this gun looks really dumb because when you're looking at it from the first person view, holding it, um, you know, we weren't designing in context, so we realize we made a lot of really bad decisions based on a meaningless 2D image, not meaningless. It's got good design information. It's got good style guides, uh, but the ability to take that style, those style parameters and interpret those into a 3D model. Um, at the end of the day, you may not even need concept. If you have a good enough style guide, you can just take a Google image and go apply these style fundamentals to this object. And if you're good and you're a good designer too, you can actually pick and choose, you know, how, what gets stylized, how it gets stylized, and then you can just use Google Images as your concept um, and still have a very stylized result. But, you know, that takes training and practice, so. But, I mean, you can certainly get your foot in the door just by nailing a concept for sure. You don't need to be a, you don't need to start out as a great designer. And in fact, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a great designer, like even close, so I'm still learning. Cool. Yeah. And I mean, knowing how to design only helps you. Um, it would never hurt you or anything like that. But, you know, like you said, pick and choose your battles. Um, you know, start, it's probably easier to get your foot in the door first by nailing a concept and uh, learning design fundamentals later. And the, the cool thing about doing that is you can learn design fundamentals if you're mindful um, as you're working on stuff you know, you're learning from the concept artist, what makes a successful design, what makes an appealing design, and, you know, using that experience to drive, um, drive what you're doing. I'm just having too much fun with this face. Again, you can hold down Alt with your, um, and, you know, model with your perspective on, I'm terrible at that. Show how to apply an alpha using surface noise when applying alpha and the resolution up to part 3D printing. How do I get high res without the jaggies? Unfor I mean, I can show you, you know, if we wanted to put a weave texture on this guy's head, uh, you know, going into surface noise. Um, you can load in your own alphas. You can go here, alpha, you can just load in your own alphas. You can use this default alpha. Um, let's go ahead and do noise plug. I like using the weave because it's a very good example of Jaggy showing up. And then mix basic noise down to zero. And then our strength and then our noise plug-in scale here. So this is the weave pattern we're going to get. Let's go ahead and crank that strength up a little bit more. Hit OK. Uh, so now this is just a um, displacement 
preview. But if we want to apply this to our mesh, we can apply it to our mesh and we're getting very low resolution. So unfortunately, if you're 3D printing and you want this stuff on there, it's all about just applying it with the high enough resolution. And when you get in here, you are going to see jaggy. So depending on what you're working on, you may get up into the 16s of millions, the 20s of millions before you get really fine surface detail without jaggies. And even here, you know, you're getting some. Um, you can try and like soften the alpha and that'll make them a little bit less harsh. Uh, so you don't get quite as many uh, alias stepping looking stuff. But um, unfortunately, that's just the name of the game is if you want all that tiny detail, you have a, you need to have a ton of resolution. Uh, if you are doing this type of thing in a video game, uh, I would say if it's not bringing the silhouette, obviously just tile it in your texture. Don't bother baking this because it's so destructive. If you wanted to change this, you can just go into Painter and be like, hey, you know what? I want to scale this a little bit bigger. And then you're done as opposed to, okay, go back to my ZBrush model, change the scale, bake it to my model, export it, bake it to the texture. Don't do that. Anything that doesn't break the silhouette, uh, just do it in the texture. Cool. Um, this question about rendering in ZBrush, can you explain why or why not to render in ZBrush or go for Keyshot? Uh, kind of depends on what you want to use. Uh, speaking of, if you go to my YouTube channel or ZBrush Radiation, I have it in there as well, at least in the later chapters. If you go in here, there is a Keyshot, ZBrush to Keyshot Bridge Quick Start, and there's also a ZBrush image based lighting. So, image based lighting, we go through and we load in HDR images. Um, in fact, one of the questions was about that. Essentially, if you wanted to light this thing with an HDR image, we would go into, uh, actually you can load it up. I want to keep saying actually. Light, uh, background, you can load up a texture in here. I'm going to go just load up a texture from our texture section. Panoramas. We'll just use this one. Wait for it. Actually, let's use this one. So we'll load this one up. And then now we can go into background and we can just throw that panorama in here. And then we can do light caps and that will, um, let me go back to, let's choose a basic material, light caps. So now we just captured that light information. Let's go ahead and turn off our main light here. Uh, so when we go and we render this thing, uh, it's going to use this uh, information, this background information. You don't have to have it on. You can just turn it off and you can go through and you can change. You can like rotate this around and recapture those lights again. Um, the, it, the video goes through all that stuff. And also in the light caps here, being able to turn off the shadows for everything, but like your main light. So I'd go through here. I think I have a macro for turn off shadows. So I go through and turn off all those shadows. So now when I render, I'll get a, <laughs> oof, I'll get a terrible result. Um, also, another thing you can do is you can turn on the floor plane. Uh, let's see, draw grid size up and down. Oh, there it is. So now when you do go through and you render, uh, I will cast a shadow on here. So let's go ahead and change that back to zero. And then we'll do a quick um, light caps. We'll choose this one. Let's choose this one. And then we'll go to macro, turn off shadows. That's essentially going through all these other lights up here and just turning off all the shadows. And then on the shadow parameters, oh, man, this, is a, this is a bad one to use. Let's use uh, this one. Let's do light caps. Uh, background. There we go. Now, you, you can see me going through all of these you know, lighting this type of stuff, uh, and, you know, and choosing this one and doing all these hoops to kind of jump through just to get a nice uh, lighting thing. Um, it's a lot easier sometimes, especially when you're doing product rendering to just go through and render in Keyshot. We can do that real quick if you guys want. Uh, let's see, turn off shadows here, PPR, there we go. So anyway, if we were so inclined, we could load up, um, have I demoed anything? recently that would be kind of, oh, Earthworm Jim. I did uh, cybernetic arms. I think those will work. So if we have something here, let's 
and we want to go ahead and just like render this in key shot, uh, that would just be a matter of going into render, external render, key shot, and then just hit BPR to load up key shot for us. And the cool thing about my computer is when we go into key shot, it uses the hell out of my cores. I have a lot of them. I have 2990WX Threadripper, so it it uses cores for sure. In fact, uh, I'm going to change my CPU usage down just so we're, we're streaming. Let's drop that down to like 88%. Okay, you guys should be able to see this-ish. So now we have our object here. And uh, then when we go through here, and the cool thing about this is we can go in here to materials and really quickly, if we want to do um, rough shiny plastic, we can just drag it on there. And then we have plastic, we can go through and change our environment. So you can see it's a lot faster. It's a lot easier to go through and choose different environments uh, and get different effects here, like so. And then we can go in here to environment and turn on just a color background reflections update and all that good stuff. Um, also, if we go in here to materials, now let's just do a plastic blue for this hand here, and then we'll go to materials here. And then we'll go to our metals. And you can go through these metals and just choose whatever you want, but um, I guess we'll do nickel. That's a little bit gross. Let's do iron. That'll work. Environment scene, some materials. We can just go through and drag and drop. And if you wanted to do, do we have a rubber? Yeah. We can throw some rubber on these. And get pretty good scene decently. And also, I think under miscellaneous, I think when I originally did this one, there's some really cool materials in here. Um, and also, let's go into our lighting and let's do product. Let's get a little bit better result here and very quickly get a nice render out of that. I prefer working with perspective off. I almost hard, I hardly ever turn perspective on unless I'm trying to match something specific and then I'll use camera view and stuff. Um, worth investing in Marvel's designer is it's only 240 instead of 490. Oh, it is. I would grab it. Marvel's designer for clothing. Can't beat it as a, especially as a production artist, like, yeah, any any clothing stuff is done in Marvel's Designer. Primary and secondary forms, it's fabulous. Detailing, still do that in ZBrush. Um, and again, sorry if I miss any stuff. I'm going to have to call it quits pretty soon here. Cool. Um, you know, and again, well, it kind of depends on what you want to render. And in fact, um, you can render high res stuff in Marmoset if you wanted to, you can export your 20 million polygon mesh and take that into Marmoset and, uh, render that out. Um, it's, it's, uh, totally doable. Uh, but if now here's the thing, this, the more box modelery it is, uh, the better time key shots gonna have. If you have something really concepty, it's a little more it's a little unforgiving when it comes to you know, if you do a lot of clean modeling with nice clean bubbles and stuff, it'll do it like these nice clean booleans that renders really well. Um, it's a little less forgiving, like I said, when it comes to um let me see uh, like a concepty sculpt type thing, uh, we can throw a. Where's my shiny? You still throw a plastic on there, and it still renders fine. And you can hold down control and, you know, wrap your light around it, and get that updated stuff. Um, but, you know, it's a cost thing too. So go through both videos. Uh, it'll walk you through that and you can kind of make your decision from there, maybe. Or, yeah, throw it in Maya and, uh, you know, use Arnold or RenderMan. Uh, 
uh, Real says, uh, are you good to be back on a semi-decent <laughs> upload schedule again? Uh, yeah, soon. Like mid-March, I'm aiming for getting back into the swing of things, at least doing it back to monthly, uh, but hopefully back to like maybe every other week, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, on my channel. I haven't streamed on my channel in forever. Uh, I am going to upload this on my YouTube channel, but... um. Yeah, get back on the swigging things. I'm, I'm aiming for mid-March after GDC to kind of start feeling out, can I go back into doing uh, stuff on the side? Uh, huge inspiration and work motivation for me. Not even joking. Oh, thanks for the kind words. Uh, I'm glad I could, I could help in any way I can. I don't know if I'm overly inspirational, uh, especially with my early morning streams, but uh, if it helps. Yeah, uh, and I haven't moved yet, but I'm moving soon. So that's part of the debacle, too, is like once I get moved to my new house and I have internet, um, I should be good to go. Cool. I'm going to see, did I miss anything in here? I'm going to restart ZBrush. And while I'm doing that, um, let's go back in here. Uh, Z Modeler. So Z Modeler brush is BZM. That's the Z Modeler brush. Uh, when I drag out my polygons, don't snap to the plane, they hover above. So when you're doing, so let's very quickly, so you want to make an insert mesh brush. So I'm going to drag out a cylinder here, go into edit mode. Let's initialize. Um, let's do 16 and four. And let's go in here to make poly mesh 3D. Another thing I like is let's go ahead and do a group by normals. Let me move this down, it's distracting me. Um, so there's a mesh fusion in here. So if we go in here and we grab our poly mesh 3D and we hit BI brush insert Boolean, I love using um, you know these shapes in here. So if we if we have uh, W selected, we can actually just cycle through these different objects here. So if you find one that you like, you can just grab it, steal it, Control Shift, grab this one. We can do delete hidden. Or if before we delete, if you grab a piece and you want to shrink it, Control Shift S to shrink and then delete hidden. So then we can make an insert mesh brush out of this, brush, create insert mesh new, and you have you can use mesh fusion functionality in here because we have a poly group here. If I just, and we don't have Dynamesh turned on, do not have Dynamesh turned on for this. You can drag this out and then you can control drag, control drag again, and it'll automatically interpolate that. Now you're gonna see it kind of smeared my edges there, turn off the smooth modifier, and now it'll go through and make sure that this thing uh, subdivides correctly. So we can continue modeling insert multiple edge loops here and we can do this and then we can say inset polygroup all and let's do a region and you know let's do another region and let's do QMesh polygroup all and then hold on shift just to pull that back and then we'll just go ahead and increase polygroups dynamic smooth so div of three or increase level of three smooth so div of four uh, if that's too tight increase level of two smooth so div of three let's try that there you go. So this can be our insert mesh brush. We're going to cover to the top here, hit B, create insert mesh new. And then I forgot what I was doing. Oh, yeah, they don't snap to the plane. So let's say I take another cylinder here, and this is going to be what we're going to be modeling on. And you drag it out, and it's and uh, on this case, it is stuck to the plane. However, if you go over here to your depth with that brush selected, you're going to see if your depth is um, like in too much, it'll be kind of buried in the plane. Uh, here, it's perfectly touching the plane, so we're good. Uh, but you can go through here and just move that depth down. If you wanted to go drag out to the middle, it'll it'll be able to do that. Um, also, with any insert mesh brushes you do, you can always go into your stroke menu, turn on curve mode, and now you can drag um, these objects out on a curve. And if you want to control that a little bit more, in my ZBrush Summit 2018, Go down, way down here. There's one called Controlling Curves. <laughs> way down here. Uh, controlling Curve Techniques. It's all in there. It's also in my um, my class as well. You can go through here, and if you want to do something very specific, in fact, let's do, um, let's grab a sphere. We'll go through and we'll clip, uh, no, we'll slice. We're gonna go, oh uh, no, let's do, just give me a slice curve, there we go. So if you tap Alt once, it'll do a Bezier curve. If you tap Alt twice, it'll do a sharp curve. So with these things, you can always go in here and stroke curve functions, your poly groups here, and then just tap, and then I'll go ahead and set these things down. Now, if you wanted them embedded, again, just go to your depth and embed them down. 
Uh, if you want them offset, say, you know what, I want this to be a panel loops here. So we go in here, that's another cool one you guys can use under Z plugin, under your, uh, where is it, panel loops master? There's so many now, um, panel loop presets. Uh, Chi Vang and Joseph Dress made this one, so you can just go and grab a preset, and then that'll go ahead and load that panel loop presets for you. But if you wanted to drop those like along the inside of here, you can isolate this one, and then instead of framing polygroups, you can do frame border, and then you can just update that. Now, if it's too close to that border, you can always remember, we did this earlier, Control Shift S to shrink, and then I'll go ahead and uh, shrink that down so it kind of offsets that a little bit. Um, however, what I would do is say, I like this outer form, but that shrink is kind of crummy. I'm gonna duplicate this off. I'm gonna isolate this. We're gonna do Control Shift S to shrink, and then we're going to delete hidden, and then we're gonna do a polish by features. Let's go into solo mode here. And that that's going to do is uh, smooth those border edges out for me. So now I can use this border edge, uh, stroke, frame my border, put those on there. And uh, if we want to space down a little bit more, go into your stroke options here. And we do curve step, we'll drop that up, drop it up, move it up, and then, then there'll be a little bit more spaced out. We can tap off, we can do split mass points. And then now this is just our mesh we use to control that. So now between these two, we have inset um, objects along here. Cool, yeah, and uh, you know, hard surface modeling, um, you know, I, I approach that from a lot of different angles. So on my art station page, you can kind of see a little bit of my thought process if you go through, um, sci-fi weapon process has some, but like on the commander or the GDC female or Halo or the boot tutorial, even the boot tutorial is mostly hard surface techniques, really. Um, these are a little bit dated, this helmet test asset. These are pretty old, old school ZBrush methodology. It's not bad, it's just old. Um, but hopefully, again, mid-March and beyond, I'll be able to spend a little bit more time. We can do like, hey, let's make a tank. Let's make a speeder. Let's make a armor set, you know, that kind of thing, and have fun doing that. But yeah, it, it does take some getting used to. If you use light boolean to cut out some of the detail vents or holes on a hard surface model, is it necessary to retopo the whole model, or a modeler retopo for their own model? Um, Generally, yeah. I mean, the modelers that my it kind of depends. I mean, it depends on what it is. You can send low res out to outsourcing. You can do low res yourself. Um, and if you are cutting in hard surface geometry, like we could even make this uh, subtractive mesh, and we can hit D on this one. Let's go ahead and do a crease PG, crease level of one, smooth so do a two, and then uh, with this turn on light booleans. So now these are all uh, cut in there. Um, if they're not deforming the surface, you could just bake this in. You could just use this as a basis for your um, low res model. Uh, and you can even just get rid of that and then just dynamesh this and zero mesh it to get your low res. Um, but if it is, you are gonna wanna go through and like game res all that, then yeah, you would have to rebuild it. You can use the information. So if we go through here and we do geometry, Boolean, or not geometry, sorry, subtool, boolean. Uh, make boolean mesh. And then now we've got this one here. Uh, you still have access to all your polygroups here. So you could like try and run a Ziri mesher and say keep polygroups and it would do a, you know, you could give it a shot. Cool, see you later, Bob, have a good day. I'm actually, I'm gonna head out now too, actually. Um, I have a question, uh, can I ask on your Twitter as it would be easier to explain what I wanna ask? Sure. Um, <laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah, you can you can shoot me a message here. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, head out now. I've got to get a allergy shot and get my day started. But uh, thanks everybody. Um, have a good day. And again, I'm gonna try to stream more. Actually, this March, since I'm going to be moving right at the first of the month, I won't be making my March stream. But again, mid March, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna really really try. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day, and uh, see you next time.